that Jesus speaks often in the Gospels about the kingdom of God. Many of the parallels talk about the kingdom of God. The most famous verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, a lot of you know it, I'm sure. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Prior to that, though, Nicodemus approaches him and says, wow, like we know that you're doing miracles here. It has to be. And, and Jesus speaks in a little bit of a cryptic language about the kingdom. He said, unless you can see the kingdom, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. And unless you're born again, unless this light goes on on the inside of you, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And many people think that's the not yet part. See the title? Now and not yet. But, but we want to make the case that it's also now. You enter his kingdom now when he becomes the Lord of your life. And I know many of you know about that little track that uh, Campus Crusade for Christ did many years ago, and it showed the picture of the throne uh, in your heart and who's sitting on the throne of your heart. They, they handed out billions of those tracks. So many people came to the Lord through that ministry, and, and it's really the Lordship. And Jesus said, the kingdom is inside of you. Yeah. That means to the extent that we're willing to submit to him, he's the Lord of our lives. But then he also said to pick up your cross daily. Now, now, why would we have to do that? Well, because there might be one more thing that you need to let go of. Just maybe. I'm just, just it's a hypothesis I have. So the, the not yet is great, but I want you to, to think about it, that we can pull the not yet into now. That's how it's worded in the New Testament, because it talks about the Holy Spirit being a down payment. You know this one, right? It's also a seal. God has sealed us as his own. And we're living in the contention of, yes, I can't wait to be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present for the, with the Lord. But Paul said, but it's to your advantage. I don't think he was on an ego trip. I think he just had so much revelation. It's to your advantage that I stay. But either way, we win. And really, we should be the people with the most hope on the whole planet. Because if we really understand what it's like to receive the not yet now, you're never going to want anything else. You're never going to want the counterfeit when you can get the real thing. So I'm going to try to back that up. And I love the Apostle Paul. I mean, I'm a marketplace minister. I still have a, a day job kind of thing. And he's a tent maker. And he's writing all this scripture out. And every time I thought about maybe I'll just retire from that job and come and work for the church, it was like, well, pray about it. And then I would read Paul saying things like, I'm not coming to be a burden on you. <laughs> and that meant financial burden. I'm not asking you for anything. He said, in fact, the father saves up for the children, not the children for the father. I was like, okay, Lord, try for another year. And that was like a long time ago. So praise God. And, you know, he has a way of getting right to the point. And I don't even think he realized that the letters he was writing were going to turn into scripture. It was just a father, that, this apostolic figure that, that raised up churches like the one in Philippi, which was the jailer, right? The very guy that was ready to kill himself started the first church in Philippi. Talk about a turnaround God. What the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. So here, this is in Ephesians. I'm saying the now and the not yet, and then in Ephesians 1. I mean, you can read this, there's a paragraph, it's one long sentence, and it's really hard to just kind of jump in the middle somewhere, but he basically says that when I pray for you, I'm praying that your, your spiritual eyes, your eyes will be enlightened. Isn't that a great word? Like the light goes on. And how many experienced that when you got saved? I remember my mom was the one that was witnessing to me, and I, she kept putting tracks in the bathroom and everywhere where I couldn't avoid them, you know, and I'd have to look at them. She was an evangelist, when I tell you. And then she just said, well, just, you know, keep this little New Testament by your bedside. And I finally said, you know what, I'm going to read the stupid book and prove that she's wrong. And she went, yes. And I bet God did that too, right? Because many people have done that. And, and then you have to eat the humble pie. <laughs> and it was in Galatians 5 when the light went off one day as I was reading scripture. And it said that your flesh and your spirit are at odds with each other. So you can't do the things you want to do because the spirit wants to lead you into a holy life, but the carnal spirit that you were born with, it's, it's a lot of things, but holy isn't one of them. <laughs> and it's like, ding, ding, ding. My eyes are opened. 
there's a spiritual war going on. It's not, the sexual act is not just a physical thing. There's a spiritual element to all of this. And there's a reason we do it on an altar and we make a vow and we invite all our family and friends to say, you can hold us accountable. This is not justice of the peace contract. This is a covenant commitment that we're making to each other. And what's, what's happened to that in the culture? So I mean, we have to be the plumb line for the truth. And Holy Spirit is the game changer. You can't accept the Lord unless the Holy Spirit is the one that prompts you. And it says that he poured out his spirit on all flesh. So it's dormant inside the unbeliever. The devil has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. But he's praying for this church in Ephesus, which is a very carnal city. right? That's where the temple of Diana was and all that like witchcraft stuff was going on. But how is that any different today? So he's praying that their eyes would be enlightened according to the working of his mighty power. Right? So God's mighty power is what enlightens us and turns on the light switch, which, we, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him as, at his right hand. How much power do you need to raise somebody from the dead? <laughs> That's a lot of power. His mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above. Can you say that? Far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name. We sang it. You're the name above all names. Worthy of our praise. Let us make you famous. One of the Psalms says, not unto us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. Not only in this age, here we go. Not only in this age, but what else? But also that which is to come. So there's the now and the not yet. This age and the age to come. We, we looked at a similar verse from Matthew uh, last week where he's, he uses this language. So it isn't meant to just be this verdict that for the rest of your Christian time here, you're going to be persecuted by unbelievers and you're going to try to share your faith and, and it's going to be nothing but horror stories. No, like I said, we should be the most hopeful people in the world. We've got the truth of the word. Our security is is found in our, we're anchored to the rock of Jesus Christ that we know whom we have believed in. And we are persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed to us against that day that we meet him. And we would love to hear him say, come on, what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Does that mean we have to be perfect? Of course not. Of course not. But should we be pressing towards the mark for the prize? of the high calling that's on your life. Could you look at somebody and say, there's a high calling of God on your life? Let the penny drop on that one. It's going to be different for every one of us. Like Lisa came up here and talked about this first choice. Uh, there's a calling on the girl that runs out. Her father was a pastor in town here, Peter Pendel. Amy Pendel is his daughter. She's been running First Choice for years. There's a great call of God on that lady's life. She's opened up five homes. Or I guess there was one, but there's five in existence right now. There's thousands of women being ministered to through that. That's a marketplace ministry. And there, she found her calling, and she's walking it out. And, it, and when that happens, like, why wouldn't God want every one of us to know our calling and walk it out? He does. And if we do that in the church, it's, it's got to flourish. It's got to have an impact on this whole region. So we're aiming for the, the not yet to come into the now. 